Hello, podcast listeners. This is your host with the most, JJ from JJ Meets World. Enjoy this hangout with Tucker and I as we discuss a lot of stuff, including uh, why you should like Don Rickles, things that the Muppets could do better in their careers, and of course, uh, why Applebee's can't be found easily in Australia. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of JJ Meets World. And by the way, if you'd like to help support our podcast, visit jjmeetsworld.com where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some killer swag at our merch shop, or click the link to Apple Podcast and give us a five-star review. One, two, three, four. JJ Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. JJ has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called JJ Meets World. I mean, earlier today, I did what I thought was at least a decent impression of an Australian accent, and I think you judged it too harshly, Tucker. Uh, you agreed with me the moment I judged it, JJ. Yeah, you but recall? I am a follower in a lot of ways, and when people <laughs> tell me an opinion about accents, I quickly follow them. Not movies, but accents. Easy way to solve this right now, JJ. Okay. Let's hear that Australian accent, bud. I mean, where are... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, directions, and, mate. And what did I tell you that you should have said? Uh, I should have said that's not a knife. Yeah, that's this is a knife because that's that's an Australian impression where you don't have to have a good accent. Because now, oh, you're quoting Crocodile Dundee, right? Yep. yep. So just do that Nick next time. Dundee, easy, Paul easy, Hogan. Easy, so, easy. Have you ever like really thought about how? Like America had an obsession with Australia for a little while it, to the point that I actually I'm still um, emotionally frustrated by the fact that that was not an actual Crocodile Dundee sequel with uh, Chris Hemsworth and all those Australian stars. When they teased like the son of Dundee. Yeah, because that teaser trailer, I was so ready to watch that movie after I saw yeah. the trailer. I'm actually surprised that they didn't go ahead and do it because oh. there was so much fan anti uh, anticipation. Oh, God, it was that good. That being said, there's a re recently there's like the most illustrious Mr. Paul Hogan that came out that That's is right. a tongue in cheek, like Paul Hogan now in his later years reliving the fame of being Crocodile Dundee. So those movies exist in the universe of them. Correct. In the Dundee-verse. Yeah. Oh, no, the Dundee-verse exists in the Hogan-verse. In the Hogan-verse, okay. yeah, that's correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> but, I mean, they're really... Even the Simpsons comments on the fact that there was this weird obsession America had with Australia at one point. And I gotta tell you something. I would love to go to Australia. Yeah? Because it's... There are be huge fun. swaths of that country that are very much like the Old West. You know, where you go out there and it's like you've only got your wits about you and you got to be careful. I would love that. I think that'd be a ton of fun. Wait, you want to go out into that, the Australian like, the outback, the outback, and you want to contend with the flora and fauna. Yeah. We just came from Applebee's. Yeah. I know there's no Applebee's out there. I've got the Applebee's app. <laughs> And it tells me where Applebee's locations when are. When you were researching your potential trip to Australia, was that uh -huh. part of it? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, know, you, never, you always want to know where your friendly neighborhood uh, bar and grill <laughs> is located. Um, but I, I think that it would be, it would be an adventure. You know, there'd be, uh, there'd be a sense of risk associated with it that would be a ton of fun. If you're looking for risk, we could just go to like North Korea or something, man. See, but North Korea wouldn't be fun because you can't commiserate afterwards. You end up in some kind of a prison. In fact, right now, just by mentioning that, somebody in North Korea is listening to this and being like, threat level yeah. to our country from the JJ Meets World podcast. Yeah, they got the jump drive tossed over the wall and yep. picked it up and there was some I Love Lucy on there, some Batman the Animated Adventures and, and a couple episodes of JJ Meets World. Darn Tootin. That's been a new strategy we've been trying to get to <laughs> the podcast out there, uh -huh. and get those numbers up, you know? Mitch Hedberg used to do a bit where he, he, he was talking about like, hey, man, I think you might have bought my album at uh, at a store, not because the store sold it, but because I went there and I just hid some. 
Did you ever listen to any Mitch Hedberg? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That man was a genius. Yep, and a, a, a singular comedian, right? Mm-hmm. No one was like that. I saw Mitch Hedberg live two weeks before he died, and he, what's interesting is he had extreme stage fright. He couldn't look at the audience while he was performing. And you think, like, this is a guy who performed in Fargo at the Fargo Theater in front of, like, 600 people and couldn't look at them, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. that is... It's amazing. Every now and then somebody tells me, like, I could never do what you do. And I said, yeah, probably not. I have a real gift to speak in front of the public Mm -hmm. and feel comfortable while I'm doing it. But that being said, there are tons of things that you can do that I can't do. And I'm not just talking about some specific skill. I'm talking about things even as simple as going on a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. I cannot muster the courage to get on a roller coaster. They terrify me. Can I tell you about when I was courting my wife? One of the things I did that was so out of character over it's like insane. the twelve years that you were courting your wife. This is at the beginning, though. So this so, okay. So this is the summer of two thousand six. Was this before or after the "you devil log" comment? This is after. Okay. This is because the "you devil log" where she quoted the movie Heavyweights <laughs> and an obscure quote to <laughs> to make that. Um, so we went with a huge group of people to Valley Fair. Uh-huh. I mean, there must have been a dozen of us who drove down there. And so we went down there, and I hadn't shared with her that I did not like thrill rides. Jill loves thrill rides. It's a great time. And so that afternoon, I went on the wild thing, which was their big roller coaster. I went on the power tower, the thing that just the rail that shoots you up, and then you fall down. Mm -hmm. And I even did that thing that treats you like a pendulum where they put you in you know, a harness and then pull you up, 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 up. And then you have to pull a ripcord, and you swing back and forth. Um. That day was the most uncharacteristic JJ day that's ever happened. But it was all because I was so smitten with this girl and I wanted to impress her in some way. Right. I I have always had this really bad anxiety, not just about like carnival rides. I just don't like them. I don't like that feeling. I don't want that rush. It doesn't, I don't re- respond to it in a favorable way. I've gone on one roller coaster in my life and that was enough. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Ferris wheels, totally fine. Some other things that are just pleasures. That's cool. But yeah, anything that's got corkscrew, monster this, no, I'm not going to, Tower of Terror, no thank you. Um, but I've always been worried about going on like that, that like maybe you and a group of friends have gone to the fair and your sweetheart is with you and she really wants to go on these rides, but I'm too chicken to do it. So she goes with like one of my buddies and they end up connecting in all these things and then I end up losing that relationship. That's always been in the back of my mind <laughs> as, a, as a young man growing up going at some point i'm gonna have to conquer my my hatred for these things because i can't let that happen yeah, you don't want to you don't want to lose your honey <laughs> yeah. let me tell you about an episode of tales from the crypt i like <laughs> so um the the quintessential old man character like in um in national lampoon's christmas vacation he plays the uncle like Mm -hmm. You know, like it was an ugly tree anyway. And like, come on, Grizz. Right. So, you know, that character actor. Yep. Okay. So he's the star of this episode of Tales from the Crypt. Gotcha. And he is a millionaire. And he has. Was that the guy who said you wouldn't be able to hear a dump truck driving through a nitroglycerin factory? Yeah. Okay. That ain't the. (laughs) That ain't the North Star, Grizz. It's the light from the sewer treatment plant. Um. (laughs) So this guy, and he's been in a bunch of stuff. I mean, yeah. the perfect old man. Is, so, is he the one who calls them the Green Boys in Major Pain? Yes, yes. Is that, that what is, he calls them, the Green yeah, Boys? Yeah, the Green Boys, <laughs> yeah. The Green Boys. So this guy is in this episode. He plays a millionaire, and he's got a young woman who helps take care of him, and she's beautiful, and he's fallen in love with her. And he tells her he's fallen in love with her, and she says, oh, but you know, you're, but you're so old and your face is so old. So he uh, goes and goes to this like mad scientist who has perfected a way to take the face off of a young, handsome man mm. and essentially swap. It's a face off. Yep. And so the which guy. They're, which they're making a sequel to now. Which, right. 
And, and it's not a, it's a direct sequel. Yeah. It's not even a reimagining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I hope they're just switching again. Right. So this, <laughs> so he spends a lot of money to have his face swapped. And then she's like, oh, that's amazing. But then your body is so, you know, like your chest and your arms are so old and weak. And so then he does a, like a torso transplant. Wow. And so eventually he has transplanted his entire body. All that's left is essentially like his brain right. in this like the guy and the uh, the other guy is now has his old body and oh, the, the, they're they're fully switching everything. they're fully switching at this point and this is i'm guessing this guy is captive who is no nope, no nope, nope. it's, his it's a guy who he's getting paid he's getting paid no so shit. every time like he loses a face that's 10 million dollars and then wow. when he switches his torso he gets 20 million dollars and so he's essentially low, but okay right so essentially he's swapping all remember it's the late 80s that's true Inflation. So he swapped everything and goes to this woman's house. And at this point now, he's pretty much penniless, but he looks beautiful and they can have like a relationship now because he looks the appropriate age to be with her. Mm-hmm. And twist, she wants to be with the old guy who has a bunch of money and can take care of her. Oh. And so this guy ends up with the girl and some dude's other body. And now this guy's young again, but has no money anymore. <laughs> and. I don't even remember why we started talking about this, <laughs> but like it remind oh because you didn't want like because you didn't want your buddies to take your girl right because I didn't want of all them to stuff. go in the tilt a whirl right. and then so, hold hands when she like when she goes oh protect me and he puts his arm around her and then I'm down there and I've got two ice cream cones ones for her and it's, mm-hmm. they're both melting but I don't want to start mine until she gets back I'm just saying be careful don't swap your money for another person's <laughs> deltoids. <laughs> Is what I'm is what I'm getting at here. I think if next time, next time I feel like uh, a lady who I'm interested in is interested, I'll probably just be up for like, hey, just so you know, um, not into fe- for carnival rides. Are you? Is that the first thing you're gonna say? I I wouldn't be surprised. Is that if a it first com- date thing? It's never happened before. I'm saying I would. That might be something I should do. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm at that age. Right. I'm I'm 35. I'm I'm still I'm not old, but I am. We are. We have both begun the journey of leaving the realm of the young right yes and so it, it, it is harder for me to get out of bed today than it was yesterday right right um and and i celebrate things like oh i got a full night's sleep last night mm-hmm. um but you're proud of yourself because you made your oil change appointment a week in <laughs> advance <laughs> or you finally watched a youtube video on how to do it yourself yep but you still go but you at least you know now <laughs> At least now I know what they're doing when I'm sitting. Don't Dalveling. you think you should be completely upfront with someone about things like uh, uh, roller coaster policy? No, I'm and no, and I'm going to tell you why. Please do, because I don't want to make a mistake, JJ. You're, I'm, you're a married man. I'm married now. Yeah, and you Which need means to you have, have wisdom. You need to have some mystery. You need to still have things that you can discover about each other right. as life goes on. Right. And some of those things are disappointing, and some of those <laughs> things are thrilling. Right. Like for example. My wife recently admitted to me that she's pretty sure she's never seen Uncle Buck. What? Yeah. Yeah. In your household? In my household. And she for sure has never seen Mary Poppins. I have it on VHS if you need. Wait. Shut up. Yep. Yep. That's she goes, painful. She's like, I that know hurts. everything about it. And so. No, let, she doesn't. Let me tell you. No, she yeah, does not. Let me get into a quick story about Mary Poppins. Please. So. I went so Chicago Walt Disney spent part of his life in Chicago and the Chicago Museum of the Moving Image had a Walt Disney the Chicago Years exhibit and included with this were some pieces from the Walt Disney archives that they brought out. Okay. So it had uh, one of the multi-plane cameras and if you what what UB iWorks created with the multi-plane camera is amazing. It's essentially multiple cells of animation that all move at the same rate so that you can get a shot that looks like it has huge dimension without having to actually animate every single page. It is even by at today's standards is mind boggling. Like they've used that concept in animation in the computer. So they have a multi-plane camera that you can see. One of the things that made me tear up when I saw it is Mary Poppins. You'll remember at the very beginning is a matte painting of London mm-hmm. that looks like it's real yep. because as the lights go down, you can start to see things start to flicker in the background. So that matte painting is actually about five feet wide by eight feet tall and was done by one of the best matte painters ever. And what they did is they poked little tiny holes in it and then they would light candles behind it. And so as things went down, you'd see little flickers of light starting mm-hmm. to take place. 
It is an old school in camera movie trick to show you all of London without having to rent like a helicopter to take a shot like that. And it was especially great to show uh, England during, you know, the the was it the 1920s that Mary Poppins was supposed to be taking place? Yeah, I mean, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing. Yeah. And even like they have smoke effects. It is a beautiful. It's not only a piece of art, but it's a piece of cinema history. So I'm looking at this thing. They have the full matte painting there, the actual one. And I tear up a little bit because it combines my love for movies, my childhood, and then just a striking piece of art. And like Jill was like, oh, like what's going on? I said, oh, my God, this doesn't this take you back to like your childhood? Like this was the beginning of the Mary Poppins movie that I watched on VHS every Sunday for like four years of my life. And she was like, yeah, yeah, I I, I guess. And so later on, I found out she had never seen Mary Poppins. So of course she doesn't have that reaction to it. (laughs) But it just it. To me, it just it drives me nuts. And I think like you've seen the 13th warrior with Antonio Banderas a dozen (laughs) times. And I think that if you don't see a movie like Mary Poppins when you're a child and because you can identify with the children in that movie. Right. You are not going to be as enthralled with it. Hey, side note. Did I text you my idea for a movie the other day? Well, that happens a lot. So which one are we talking about? So uh, it's Night at the Museum. So they've made three Night at the Museum movies. Are you familiar with the premise of these films? Yeah. There is an ancient Egyptian tablet, and it makes everything in the Natural History Museum come to life. And then part of the the grouping of things, like the exhibit, that's what I'm going for, gets shipped to the Smithsonian in the second one. Oh, okay. And so then everything at the Smithsonian comes to life, right? right? And in the third one... There is another evil Egyptian like king who wants a tablet for himself so he can stay alive. And I think Ben Kingsley's in the thir- third one. And Hank Azaria, I think, is the villain in the second well, that's one. That's Robin Williams' last movie. It was, yeah. Yep. Right? Because he's in all three of those. Yep. So it's Teddy Roosevelt. So do you know who made that movie? 20th Century Fox. Okay. By the way, it's also written by two of the guys from the state as well as Reno 911 okay. who wrote an amazing book like how to write movies to become rich and famous and it's a how to manual of like listen you write the child you know the the childish night at the museum movie so that you can make a bunch of money so you can make your passion project right. it is the most honest book about hollywood i've ever read it's amazing so 20th century fox made those three movies now owned by what company disney so why not Night at Disneyland, mm-hmm. where this tablet finds its way in the backpack of Ben Stiller's grandson now into Disneyland, and he's got to go and take care of it. Could you imagine how amazing that would be, where they go to the tiki room and actual birds are now singing, and then a bunch of Dumbos are flying around from the Dumbo ride? It's a small world, like literally is a small world of light, like all these things coming to life. So Disney, if you're interested in this idea, I've pretty much done all the work for you. <laughs> it would take me about five more minutes to scratch out like the rest of the dialogue, but it would be amazing. I've never gone to Disney. Think World. of the Hall of Presidents. All the presidents would come to life. That would be cool. And he'd have to like team up with them. They would be like nightmare fuel presidents, like mm-hmm. the nightmare fuel presidents at the Shields Arena or whatever it's called here, the Shields yeah. store or whatever. The Shields, <laughs> whatever it's called, I don't know. Shields All Sports, whatever. Shields, Shields. It's called Shields. It's got those um, dumb presidents. There is something that drives me nuts is recently someone had said that their coat was stolen and they got it at Shields. <laughs> and I don't know if they're using voice to text or what was going on, but it was a there was being shared on the Facebooks that they had lost it at Shields. And it d- d- drove me nuts for some reason. Anyway, in this story. Mary Poppins would be at like this thing. So you'd be able to do like a fun Mary Poppins bit. Well, the the, the real opportunity here is for Mary Poppins to join the Avengers. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. my God. Can yeah. you imagine if the collector gets a hold of that tablet and brings it up to his collection? Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> see, and like maybe that's how uh, Palpatine was able to resurrect him. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, right. The ancient Egyptian tablet from Night what? at the Museum. Have you have you ever been to any of like the Disney or Universal or Six Flags? No, I mean the, is the biggest, Valley Fair the biggest. Valley Fair is the biggest, uh, yeah, like uh, fair, I've, a tourist attraction, anything like that that I've been to. Never been to Orlando Studios. Never been to Walt well, Disney World or Land or whatever. Um, and 
the thing is, is that I really wish I had done that as a kid because that's where it sounded like a magical idea to me. Because it, the way it, the advertising looked, you're stepping into a Disney cartoon. You're shaking hands with Mickey Mouse himself, right? And doing all these amazing things. And in those commercials, they don't show the long lines. They don't show the hot sun beating down. They don't show the vomit that's next to one of the cages. Like, they don't show you that stuff. Cages? They probably keep things in cages there, right? No. I've never been <laughs> and, there, JJ. And, uh, let me tell you something. You Where would is... never see vomit. They are on that, a like, immediately. Right. I mean, I'm sure they have something that makes it look like melted ice cream instead yeah. or something. Where do they keep Pluto? Pluto the dog? Yes. Like the real dog? Yeah. It's been dead for years. <laughs> For years. How else are they supposed to keep people out of the Walt Disney cryo chamber without they've got bars? They've got they've got like uh gates. It's just a series of gates here's, that get you in trouble. Here uh, y- this just made me think this whole talk about uh Mary Poppins joining the Avengers, Avengers. just made me think of this video I saw on the, uh, which is the worst way to start a story, right? I saw this video I once. Saw a video. You should see it. However, this video um killed me. And I've watched it every day since I've seen it. It's at some kid's birthday party. I don't know where where in the world they are. It's at some kid's birthday party. And there's like a banner in the back. And they've got a Spider-Man. They have a, a Captain America. They have an Iron Man. And they have a Batman. And then they have Thanos, who is on the floor right now. And Batman is holding Thanos down while the other heroes stand around him, right? And Batman's talking on the microphone about how they're going to have to defeat Thanos. And the kids in the party, (laughs) they get swept up in the energy of the moment. And one kid bolts forward and full on just kicks Thanos in the face. (laughs) And it's a person in a suit. So a mom jumps up to grab the kid, but by the time she's got the kid up, three more kids have descended on Thanos. So now Batman is swatting away kids from Thanos. Well, the other three superheroes have frozen. They don't know what to do. Right. They're like, oh my God, someone they're, kicked Jerry in the head. They're they're watching Batman, who's from the wrong universe. Right. He's not even part of this thing. Protect Thanos from children. <laughs> it's so worth seeing. Uh, I knew a couple people who've had to wear mascot suits over the years, and they said you'd be surprised how violent children are and yeah. are constantly trying to kick. I'm one of them. You know, were you? I was in that in that uh, bunny costume. Oh yeah. For Easter. Yeah. Oh, I forgot that you did time in a uh, in a suit. Yeah, and I mean, like you're right. I mean, the you become a receptacle of violence in 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 those suits. A little girl, not nary more than three, four years old shows up and does not want to sit with the Easter bunny. But what she does want to do is she wants to pick up the eggs, the large eggs that are on the set and just throw them at the Easter bunny. Mm, so that happened. And then, you know, kids have seen uh mall rats and they know that they attack the Easter bunny in that. They think it's funny to attack the Easter bunny. So that happened a couple of times. Um, yeah. It being, I have nothing but mad respect for people who grind out some cash, putting on a, a suit like that, because that's no fun. And that is there's there there is no air conditioning system in most of those things. Maybe at the Disney's and stuff where they're out all day or no, where, I don't think you don't so. Think so? Uh-uh. Because they've they've invested that space into other technology, like allowing Mickey Mickey's eyes to blink. That is stuff that, like that. I don't think they need to. Well, we have to make his eyes blink. Therefore, you can't be cool inside. No, no. I mean, it's a matter of like there's only so much space for gears and servos and stuff like that. And so. If we're going to make the eyes blink and put that motor in there, we might not have enough room to like include a, you know, like an air conditioning unit of some sort. I can't imagine what that would have been like as a kid if, if they had had that tech at the time to make Mickey and Minnie talk to you. Because I've seen videos. It's good. It, are they playing pre-recorded messages or is the person inside actually speaking? Let me tell you something. Let Please. me tell you about the thing that blew my mind last time I was in Disney World. And it's been... A decade now you, since were, I was Weren't there? you going to go, but then COVID happened? Yeah, I literally, it was a, like a f- Friday. No, it was like a Thursday. And on Friday, I was set to fly, and I was going to meet friends in Denver. And then we were going to fly to Anaheim and spend a week at Disneyland. And we canceled it, and then they closed down Disneyland. And Disneyland hasn't reopened at the time of this recording. So right. it's been closed for almost a year. Mm-hmm. That is a massive amount of money that they're losing every single day. Um, so yes, I was about to go back to Disneyland. Here's I, I went to Disneyland when I was in fourth grade. I went to Disneyland 
the next time when I was on a road trip with our friend Jared. Okay, I went to Disney World when I was in fourth grade. Disneyland when I was 20 on a road trip with our buddy Jared Nillis. That was a really fun day, by the way. <laughs> and then I went to Disney World with Jill when we were going out on a cruise. And then I went to Disney World again when... Uh, so like no Euro Disney. No, no Di- Euro Disney. Okay. And I would go, by the way, like, sure. even though you're like, why would you go all the way to France and go to this? Because it's different than our Disney. It's got different <laughs> stuff. Anyway, better castles than the one they have there. I don't, I've probably mentioned this on the podcast before, but it's worth noting. Again, this is 10 years ago. I went to a thing called like talking with crush. Who's a character from the finding mm-hmm. Nemo franchise. He's the like, he's the turtle who talks like this. So what it is, is you go into this room and there are benches. Not booths, not seats, but like just benches. And you sit and Crush is in this 3D animated realm and he comes down and he's like, hey, kids. And you think you're just watching a recorded video. And he talks about the ocean and how important it is we keep it clean. And then he asks to take questions. And then a little girl will raise her hand and then the park, whoever from the park comes over and puts a microphone in her face, and she says, who's your favorite princess? And then Crush responds with something like, or, what's your favorite movie? And then Crush goes, what's a movie? And my jaw dropped. Fully rendered, mm-hmm. you know, three-dimensional uh, animation. Keeps asking, you know, questions keep getting asked, and he's like, hey, dude in the blue sweater. And it's real-time rendered animation, wow. and someone is just... Sitting there with probably a camera feed, being able to see what these are, talking into a microphone. It floored me. This is a decade ago. This is a decade ago. It was the closest thing I've ever seen to a living cartoon. And it was wasted on the children who were there. (laughs) (laughs) They were just sitting there picking their noses and being like, I want ice cream. (laughs) And I am sitting here being like, my God, this is how humanity ends. <laughs> so later on that day, we ended up at, they called it the monster, monster, uh, monsters, Inc. laugh floor. And you text in jokes while you're waiting in line. That's the other thing that Disney's done this brilliant. The line is even part of the attraction. They're just smart. Yeah, really smart. So you text a joke and your joke might be picked. And so I texted in what kind of cheese doesn't belong to you? Nacho cheese. Okay. Not yo cheese. Nacho cheese. Oh, I got it. Thank you. Right. Though. And so, again, using that same real time 3D, a monster walked out, not a man in a suit, like a 3D rendered like monster walks out. He goes, ah, JJ has this joke for you. <laughs> and it goes, what kind of cheese does it belong to you? And then you wait and you hear someone yells like, nacho cheese is like, thanks for ruining the joke, guy. <laughs> uh, and again, my jaw drops and I am just blown away at what they're creating right in front of you. So could you imagine, I could imagine you getting that as a Muppet experience. Yeah, I actually, I dream about that. The only downside with that as a Muppet experience is like Crush, all you got to do is kind of like one of these voices and it's close enough. And like the monster one, like it wasn't Sully, it wasn't any of the main monsters, it was a side one. So some, if they could find a way to like make Kermit or Fozzie's voice and like, you know, record like every word in, in the, you know, in the English language. And then they, whatever they say, gets modulated into that. Amazing. Now they did do a pretty amazing Muppet show uh, that's been in Liberty Square, which is the sort of like all American. It leads into the Hall of Presidents, and it's all about Americana. And what they did is great moments in Muppet history. And what it was is on the second floor of these colonial buildings, the windows swing open, and there's Kermit, Fozzie, and Miss Piggy, and they reenact famous moments from American history. Oh, that's awesome. And so they have the people actually pre-record it, but the sound is coming from inside the window, so it actually sounds like Kermit is right. you know, is speaking from there. And they had like 12 different shows that they would do. And then Sam the Eagle comes in, chimes in when something's like not correct and uh, those were amazing. That's cool. That's and so cool. I haven't had a chance to see one of those live. But let's say, but let's say like you get a special invite to like come visit the set of Sesame Street. 
Mm. And they arrange a thing where they're like, hey, listen, we're going to have the actual performers in this one room. They're just going to play. Like you guesting on Sesame Street or a Muppet show, you'd probably just die happy oh. after that, right? Yeah. I could have a heart attack while it's happening Let, and I'd say, die with a smile on my face. Let's say you're the, the scene opens, fade in, and it's an empty Sesame Street. And you walk in, the sun rises, right? So you've wandered in from the edge of town and uh, <laughs> you are greeted by a Muppet who now gives you a tour of Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. Which Muppet is doing that? I think on, it's uh, on Sesame Street. Yeah. Specifically, yes. it's going to be Telly. Oh, yeah. really? I have a thing for the Muppets, just like Fozzie, who have poor self-esteem. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, Oscar. I, there's something about that. And I love the fact that I, you know, I'd want it to be a monster. And I feel like Telly would give me the best tour of Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. Either that or it's going to be Bruno. But that's the hard part. Bruno never speaks. Right. So it's it's a toss up for me between Oscar the Grouch and Bluebird. Actually. Oh, Bluebird, mostly because I still carry it with me that in kindergarten, me and some kids were talking about Sesame Street and characters we liked. And I said, I really like Bluebird. And they were like, who's that? And I was like, well, he's like Big Bird, but he's blue and he's a superhero. And they, they said, that's not real. It never happened. Yeah, it did. I saw it yesterday. That's There's no Bluebird character. There was a Bluebird character and he was a superhero. I think, the, were they cousins or something? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they just used Big Bird, but they just turned him blue with like a computer or something. Like that. No, I think it was the big blue bird they used in Follow That Bird. And they're like, well, we now have a giant oh, blue bird that makes sense. costume of Big Bird that's blue. Let's do something with it. That makes sense. I still, I need to get a copy of this because this is, it, I would love to start this as a Christmas tradition. In fact, when I do finally start a family and have kids, I think what I'd like to do for, as for them as young kids is at Christmas, play them that Sesame Street Christmas special where Big Bird is waiting for Santa Claus on the rooftop. Mm -hmm. Christmas on Sesame Street. And then he falls asleep. And I remember that shot of hearing the snow, the steps Crunch. in the snowfall walk up and past Big Bird. And it, as a kid who was obsessed with Santa Claus, I was like, wake up. He's right there. That's such a beautiful episode. And mm -hmm. isn't, isn't it like uh, Oscar is talking about how he doesn't believe in Santa or something yeah. like that? And he, then he does, he gets a gift or something. Yeah, I, it, Oscar's one of those guys who I think, in a way, it was the ultimate, like, I say this, but I really feel mm -hmm. something different. Like, I say I don't care, but I really do, but he just doesn't want to show it. Oscar, so a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. The Carol Spinney, who played Oscar the Grouch, was also Big Bird. Mm -hmm. A few other characters, but those are the two primary characters that he played until he passed away recently and had retired slightly before that. 2011, Greg Carlson, Katie Smith, and I go to Toronto for this film festival, and the Big Bird documentary, I Am Big Bird, is premiering there. It hadn't even picked up a distribution yet, so we see an early cut of this movie, and I'm floored by it. It rocks me. It is such a good documentary. All of our childhoods are coming back to us, and then the movie is over, and the lights come up, and they go, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. and Mrs. Spinney and Oscar the Grouch. And the Spinneys walk on stage and he has Oscar with him. And I start crying immediately. I, I, it's, it's Oscar the Grouch. It's the Oscar the Grouch. And Oscar is taking questions from the audience and going back and forth with Carol about, about the answers. And I tried to get a question and I wasn't able to, but that was such a cool, magical moment that I wasn't prepared for. We had no idea that they were there. You, I mean, you got an, ex, an experience that very few people have had in this world. Yeah. Number one, to watch someone who's so good at their craft being able to perform. Yeah. Like the, the, the way he performs Oscar the Grouch is amazing because Oscar, his, like, his head comes forward, a, like kind of like a viper a little bit, you know, like yeah. when, he, when he talks. And so, because when he goes back, like when he pulls back, it, is a it's striking to kind of see it in that way right. and he just he's so good at manipulating those puppets and bringing them to absolute life also think about this think about the fact that he was able to take an oscar puppet mm -hmm. and perform it at will like yep. in in a modern day where people are so careful about every little piece of what's going on and they don't you know they don't want any spoilers they want anything you know it's not like Chris Evans got to hang on to his Captain America shield and just, you know, bring it out anytime right. he wanted. Right. There were all of these people who kept, you know, kept all these secrets. But they were like, no, Carol's going to take Oscar 
He probably had like a traveling Oscar that right. went with him wherever you know, whenever he went to go do something. And, and it's it's also I'd say debatable which Muppet character had a greater impact on pop culture, Big Bird or Kermit the Frog. I mean, they're mm-hmm. they're both they both have their. I would probably go with Kermit just because he's the flagship character of the company, like Spider Man or Superman. Um, uh, it, it, both are undeniable, but um, Big Bird just had that kind of universal appeal of warmth because he was a child. Yep. He was childlike, whereas Kermit was more of a uh, anxiety ridden uh, journalist um, who was married to a pig. And so Big Bird, I would argue, and of course, the famous eulogy of Jim Henson. Oh, come on. How does Carol Spinney do that performance that day? The man who he owed everything to. Right. This genius who passes away. And then Carol goes on stage as Big Bird, as Big Bird in like a tie and stuff. And and like he has one arm up in the head. The other arm is in one of the sleeves. The two arms are tied together. So when he'd lift one arm, he'd lift the other. And then he's looking down in the suit at a heavy television monitor that's hanging on him. Right. And he's and then he performs. What did he did? He say he perform, performs. It's not easy being green that's it. because he was eulogizing Kermit, yep. not Jim Henson. Not Jim Henson. And then he, what he says goodbye, Kermit, right? Yep. Come on. I'm sorry you teared up. I know, about, right? <laughs> I, my sister makes fun of me because like once a year I watch Jim Henson's New York City funeral. Let's just put it this way. Your sister has no business making fun of you for getting teary-eyed and right, stuff. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's a Charmin commercial it, and Chrissy starts crying. Uh, JJ Meets World listeners, if you have the opportunity, I highly recommend that you, you can watch it on YouTube, Jim Henson's yeah. funeral. Because it's not something that's so sad and sappy the whole time, but it is honestly a uh, it's a love letter to someone who created and in and and inspired other people's to is people to create. Yeah, and it is just amazing. And I watch it. I watch it once a year, and I find it to be like not only very fitting for who Jim Henson was as a man. Like no one was allowed to wear black. Um, we stole even an idea from it at my mom's funeral and we gave everyone these like leaves mm. on like uh, popsicle sticks that we glued <laughs> like to be kind of like, you know, there's some color and my yeah. mom loved the fall. But they had the Muppet Workshop made all of these little butterflies on on um, mm. wires. And so they, all these people had butterflies on wires in there. Anyway, it's, that- it, it's, an, it's an amazing thing to watch. And I mean, we're. Gosh, we're at. Almost at 30 years since Jim Henson has passed. And we just lost Carol last year, right? Yep. Yep. And, you know, a lot of the original Muppet performers are gone. Yeah. Um, Dave Goals is still around. Uh, obviously, Frank Oz. But Frank Oz doesn't have anything to do with the company anymore. If, and- if you get a chance to see I Am Big Bird, one, the, one of the things that makes the movie so wonderful is the trove of archival footage they have mm-hmm. from the very beginnings of Sesame Street and and the Muppets and all of that. You know, like Carol Spinney almost got fired. He wasn't doing well. Yeah. He hadn't found the voice for Oscar. Nothing was making sense. And he almost lost the gig. And then he ends up, you know, just blossoming into Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch and all these other characters. Creating some of the most iconic characters yeah. of all time. It was so cool to see him in per- and his wife in person as well, who I'm not sure. I think she may have passed away as well at this point. But um, Was her name also Carol? No. Um, uh, at that same film festival, Greg and I also saw the movie about the amazing Randy, who was mm. the the guy who would, he was a magician who would debunk psychics oh, and stuff all yeah, the time yeah, yeah. back on like the Tonight Show and stuff. And he had started the amazing meeting out in Vegas, which is like a skeptics meeting and um, was really well known. And that was fun, too, because he was there for Q&A. And I got to ask the first question of the amazing Randy, because Greg and I were the last two people to show up for the screening. And we showed up right as it's about to start and we get ushered in to the two front and center seats. For some reason, those two seats didn't get taken. So we get those two seats. The place is full. And we get sat in those two seats. And so he's as far away from me as you are. And when it's time to I raise my hand, you see me immediately. And I got to ask him, who in public life today do you think severely needs a debunking? And he just kind of said, oh, that's a really tough question. It's I'm going to have to just say in general, all politicians right now. Um, but yeah, it was cool to cool to see. And he's dressed like a magician. He's got like a wizard cape and hat and stuff. Fantastic documentary, too. There's an old television show. This is 
to follow me on this, okay? Always. So it's to the called, gates of hell, JJ. What's it called? It's called uh, Today's Special, I think. Yeah. Is, is it a movie? No, it's a television show. And it's about a magician who uh, places a spell on like a golfer's cap. And it brings inanimate things to life, kind of like the Frosty, mm. the snowman story. But it gets placed on a mannequin in this department store, and the mannequin comes to to life at night. And the stock woman who works there is like her his best friend. There's a puppet mouse and a puppet that is in the puppet interacts with people in real life like it is a real thing. Okay. And he's the security guard and you can't see his eyes because the cap so low and he's got a big like bristle mustache. And I used to watch that show nonstop and the magician's always trying to get the magic hat back because he wants to bring other things to life, but they want to leave it on their favorite mannequin. Um, and I vividly remember the finale of this show. So I think it was produced in Canada and it was on uh, Nickelodeon a bunch when I was a kid. And there's probably only like 25 episodes total, but the final episode is the department store is going to be torn down because some evil like real estate tycoon is going to take over and wants to turn it into condos or something like right, that. But they right. love the store. It's in a downtown area yeah. and they love the store. Let's save the youth center. Right. right. And they can't find the deed. And that's the thing, right? <laughs> and I, I've always wondered, like that Hollywood, sounds like such a technicality right. that wouldn't really be an issue. <laughs> well, but but here's the thing, <laughs> I like I am set up because of Hollywood that that a deed is the most important thing, and like if right. you don't have it, you cannot prove ownership, and someone can just take it out from underneath you, right? And it's going to be rolled up like a scroll, right? And it, someone's <laughs> hidden it somewhere, and so divots taken out of the sides. <laughs> It's their search for the deed, and, and I won't sign with an X. Yeah, one hundred percent. And there's some kind of, like with a quill, yeah. like so a quill was used for it. And in this one, it turns out it was hanging behind a piece of cheese, like a picture of cheese, yeah. in the mouse's little apartment. It's the first letter, like red and in script, like yep. a larger yep. before it it's, goes. Into you the know, it's like it's a, gi- a giant here, and then all the like rest is small scribble. And there's like a, a stamp with some, is there a some scene wax? where there's like basically like a football game of the deed where like the competing interests are trying to get it. No, but that would have made it more exciting. It was a rush against the clock, right? I, like they needed to get a picture of this deed that's make, downtown. I'm but, picturing Lady in the Tramp when she's trying to pull the newspaper through for mm. for for Mr. Darling or whatever, and and get and he has to open it and reaches through for the coffee. Yep. I figure like that's the deed, and the deed is still going to be valid even though it's got a giant coffee giant hole in the center. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, I, th- so th- this this deed you're saying this this no, show, that, that, I mean that's, that's basically the end of my story. It. Like I re- that's the finale, and I vividly remember it because I was so invested in like, no, this place, the evil, the evil land baron can't get a hold of this, which set up a long line of me watching movies where I hated land developers. Right. The same thing, and there's one called like the Dirt Bike Kid, where it had uh, Peter Billingsley, the little boy from A mm. uh, Christmas Story. But he had like a magic dirt bike that was alive and they needed to save like Mike's hot dog hut. Does this does dirty work fall into this genre? Because it is against an evil developer. Yeah. Who wants to knock yeah. down uh all those those apartments. With the with the people who are paying less money than they should. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I guess technically dirty work with Norm MacDonald would fall into it. <laughs> that is one of my guilty pleasures. I tried watching it the other day, and I only got about half an hour in before I was like, well, I've seen enough for have you, today. Have you ever seen the full movie? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Because when- I didn't have a lot of friends and wore sweatpants. I've seen almost everything. Yeah, but you're you're talking about it with the ignorance of someone who's never seen it for its true value. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was also a Don Rickles fan, so I watched that's it for the true. Don Ricklesness. And that's the whole if if you see no other scene in Dirty Work, you should watch the Don Rickles right, scene. Right, the movie theater scene. I always think of two scenes, one where they trick the frat boys into attacking the cops. Mm-hmm. Um and then the one where they bury dead fish all over the house and end up causing a gang war that murders like a bunch of people. And they're they're sitting there and they hear it from the other yeah. room. Yeah. When you were talking about um I've uh, seen the movie. <laughs> season endings. Yeah. What's or uh, like the last show? Uh, the last finale. Finale. Last uh, series finale, not season mm-hmm. finale. Series finale. What is like the most devastating series finale you've watched? Where after watching it, you felt like you needed to go lay down. Dinosaurs. Mm. Uh, another Jim Henson reference yep. right there. That was dark. Yeah, because because Earl creates a nuclear winter, right? 
Yeah, there's there's a uh, like a meteor that's headed for Earth. No, oh no no no, they need rain, and they think they need to make clouds for the rain. So they think if they drop a bomb in the volcano, right. it'll make rain clouds. Yeah. But instead, it creates just a layer of soot that blocks out the sun. Yeah, essentially, it's the it's the end of the reign of the dinosaur <laughs> on the planet, and it ends with them knowing that they're gonna die. Yeah. Yep. Essentially, it'd be like watching Toy Story 3, <laughs> only the claw doesn't come and grab them and they all get incinerated. Yep. Not the mama and death comes for us all. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That's, that one hit me hard as a kid watching it. That's, on my, li- the, uh, that's on my list. But have you seen the season finale of David the Gnome? Uh uh-uh. uh. Dude. I love David the Gnome, by the way. I, I do too. Tom uh, Tom Bosley as the voice for the American. Cause I think it's a. Uh, Norwegian show or something first. I would they, hope so because that, it's very Norwegian in yeah. culture. Uh, it's 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 from Europe and then they tra- they redid it for for the states. But the last episode is a, is a death episode. Um, in the world of of David the gnome, gnomes can live to be a few hundred years or whatever. And then when a gnome dies from old age, they turn into a tree. And so him and his wife realize we are now at the end of our lives. It's time for us to move on to that next plane of existence. And the two of them, and then a friend of theirs, I forget his name, they go on this little journey and the the fox carries them there. And then before they're going to go up to this hilltop to say their last goodbyes, they say their last goodbye to the fox. And like, you know, you need to stay here. And they say goodbye and he's crying and he starts to walk away and then he chases after them, right? And he gets right to the top of this hill and then you see the three gnomes in the in the middle of this beautiful, like, a sea of grass and David and his wife turn to each other and they start telling each other how much they love each other and how thankful they are that they've had each other in their lives together and how it, it's, we wish, I wish I could see you again after this and that kind of thing. And then all three of them turn into trees and him and his wife are two trees that are intertwined with each other forever. And the show is over and I'm eight and I'm crying at a babysitter's house. It's Come a beautiful on. story. It's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I really want to do a film of David the Gnome starring Paul Giamatti. Oh. That would be my my choice. That's a good idea. And do do a trilogy so that you can build a really nice emotional arc to that ending. Because mm-hmm. I don't think you could do that in one movie. No, and David the Gnome, like, it's trolls that they fight in David yeah, the Gnome, right? Like, yeah. or Those are the essential enemies that they deal yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. And so... We would love watching more stuff with trolls. Yeah. People can't get enough of trolls. <laughs> I want to say too that they're protecting against like industrialization or something. I feel like they're protecting the forest, but I can't remember exactly if that actually comes into it or not. Like if there are loggers or something, I really can't so remember. Let me ask you this: Do you carry that through to your real life? So, like when you see a tree being cut down, do you does it kind of not that you think that was a gnome, mm. but do you get a re- a visceral reaction from it that maybe like t- unlocks something in the back of your mind? I think results may vary. It really just kind of depends. Um, it depends on the tree. I think it depends on everything that's going on there. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not when sure. When I see something carved into a tree, I'm instantly brought back to the movie Fern Gully. Right. Which is a, definitely in that genre of mm-hmm. evil industrialization, as is Lord of the Rings, I guess. Yeah, really. What is it? Smog? Is that the name of the evil villain? Is it like a, it's like, isn't Infern Gully? Isn't it oh, like it's a Hexus? Hexus. But isn't mm-hmm. he like a smog cloud? Yeah. He's essentially, he's pollution. He's pollution. voiced by Tim Curry. Oh, yes. And this, and what's interesting is in Fern Gully, it's the first time that they've ever met man. And they mm. re, and he realizes that man is his best partner because man is trying to do the same thing that he does, which is destroy the forest. And I remember feeling funny. When the human man and the fairy woman are like together in the water, don't they like embrace and have kind of like a love, like like a romantic yeah. moment there? Yeah. I remember as a kid being like, I feel funny. I <laughs> thought she was really cute. Oh, she's very attractive. Right. She had that kind of like that haircut that was really popular in the 90s. That It's a pixie cut almost, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember, though, does she become... Big size? Does he become small sized at the I end? I think he ends up getting big sized again because he helps stop them. Oh, like so they go their separate machine. ways. Yeah. Oh, so it's it's. Uh, it was never meant to be. Never meant to be. That's too bad. I would. I want them to find their way back to each other. Let's well, make now, that given, sequel. I haven't seen Fern Gully too. I know that there's a direct to video sequel, so I haven't seen it. Maybe 
Zach, I think his name was. He's a blondie, right? Yeah. Kind of mullet head. Doesn't yeah. doesn't he have like I, I feel like the first he's scene He's got with, blue jeans and like yeah. a white tank top. I feel like the first scene with him is he's in the machine and he's like listening to music or something and like spraying trees. Is he, that he's, him? he's not in the machine, he's just spraying he's doing trees. The spraying. Now here's what I think is weird. So they have this giant machine that's meant to cut down trees and then like slash it and essentially turn them into boards. Yeah. But yet he's walking around like tagging trees, but it's cutting down every tree. <laughs> So why are you tagging yeah. trees? Why are you letting us know which ones you're planning on doing yeah. this to? Do you think loggers don't let their kids watch that movie? Without a doubt. <laughs> Without a doubt. Because even in it, the human beings are so ignorant about what's going on uh-huh. that they need to see the power of the fairy forest. What's the name of the fruit bat? Uh, Batty. Is it just Batty? Yeah. That's a miss. <laughs> Voiced by Robin Williams. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and it, he's got like electrical currents running through his head. Or is it yeah, my- so he was a, he was an animal that was being tested on. So he was like a laboratory test animal who gets free. Yeah. OK. And so like and he does the baddie rap is what it's is, called. Is, isn't there a character very similar to that in Anastasia? Uh, well, uh, he is um, uh, not Nosferatu. Uh, <laughs> who's the Russian wizard who like never could die oh, Rasputin Rasputin he was Rasputin's like right hand man and he was just a bat okay and I, f- I believe that was voiced by Hank Azaria in my mind I feel like I'm going they used the same animation cells but I'm sure they didn't no although I did just watch an interesting thing where uh Disney apparently was the king of like reusing animation and so there's a sequence where it's Christopher Robin in one of the Winnie the Pooh features and then Mowgli from the Jungle Book and yeah. they're running and doing the same thing. And so all they did was just re, you know, make one a Jungle Boy and the other one, a, you know, a, a British measure. fop. Cost saving measure. Yeah. And I bet they did that stuff all the time. There, like are, you, there are a bunch of examples I think of. I think, I think the Rescuers did that a couple of times. Yeah. Rescuers ended up reusing some animation of stills of something else. Let's bring it full circle. Let's do it. Rescuers Down Under mm. is the superior Rescuers film. Agreed, 100%. I also remember I saw the Rescuers Down Under without knowing the Rescuers was a thing. So I just thought the movie was just the Rescuers Down Under. Mm. And then years later at Mama Luke's house in Kentucky, she had the Rescuers. And I was like, what is this? It doesn't say Down Under. Well, yeah, where's Mara Hute, and, yeah, the great the, golden eagle? The Australian guy was not there. Yeah. Not voiced by Paul Hogan, too. I feel like that's a real What was the name of... Because the, the mice, they're a couple, right? Yeah, Bianca and Bernard. Bernard. Mm-hmm. Voiced by Bob Newhart. Bob Newhart, yep. Who did a great... That's one of the times where I really feel like he nailed that character and the animators nailed the, like, anxiety, you know, kind of milk toasty aspects of... Yeah, of Bob Newhart and really nailed it with that. I've always I always thought that Bob Newhart would have made a really great dinner guest. Oh, without doubt. I, th- I just don't why though. I don't know why that is, but so Bob Newhart and Don Rickles were best friends. Do you know that? No shit. Yeah, they were really really good friends. I had no idea. So much so that like he uh, the the Newharts and the Rickles would vacation together all the time. So there's vacation footage of them like at the Great Wall of China. Um. <laughs> And Bob Newhart tells a bunch of really great stories about Don Rickles in the documentary Mr. Warmth, the mm-hmm. Don Rickles Project. Um, and they, he talked about how, like, he's the sweetest man you've ever met. And he goes, and he embarrasses you wherever you go. <laughs> like, no matter what, he's got some kind of you know crack and it's going to just it's going to make you laugh. But you're also going to be embarrassed. Um, also in Mr. Warmth, the Don Rickles Project. You get that amazing story of when Johnny Carson uh, mm-hmm. was yep. mad at him about the cigarette box. Yep. If you've never seen that, you JJ Meets World listeners, go to YouTube and search Don Rickles cigarette box, and you will see probably one of the first instances where you get to see behind the scenes right. in a television studio. Once you've done that, go on YouTube and search Don Rickles dirty work. Watch that scene and then search... Howard Stern Artie Lang dirty work because they talk about that scene on Howard Stern because Artie Lang was the co-star with Norm Macdonald and he's the one who gets called a baby gorilla by by uh, who uh, Rickles was ad libbing. Saget had written him lines um, and he showed him. He's like, you're a dummy. I'm not going to say any of these. You're why, a hockey why, why, why would I say this? And he apparently he just walked in and just ruled the set when he came in. And so when they're like, all right, go. 
he just started going and he was just supposed to rip on Artie Lang, but Norm MacDonald kept breaking. So when he laughs in the scene, that's Norm MacDonald actually breaking. <laughs> Don Rickles turns to him and goes, why don't you get a horse and move out into the country and stop bothering everybody? <laughs> Oh, that's good. Oh, man. Don, yeah, Don Rickles was the kind of comedian where even if you had no idea what he just said, you would realize both that you just got destroyed and you should be grateful that that just happened to you. You were just blessed by Don Rickles. Mm -hmm. Who they just uh, who played Don Rickles in The Irishman? It was. um, um, He's another stand up comedian. He does a lot of radio now, but I forget his name. Yeah, I can't think of it either. Shoot, Not, what is his name? It'll come to me. While we're sitting here, I I hated the Irishman. Me too. I didn't care for it. So it's so dumb. Um, but you know, like I realized, like I might not like. I think Martin Scorsese is a great director, but not everything he's no. made is great. No, nope. because he made Taxi Driver and then he made Hugo. You know, mm -hmm. um, not he, one right after the other, but but <laughs> at one point, like happen. he was thinking about they happen. Uh, I to me, I think the low point is Gangs of New York, and I know that that's not a popular thing to say, but I just think that that movie is not. Yeah, it it didn't good. rock me, but there are things like there are takeaways from the movie that are great. Like I would like to hold on to Daniel Day Lewis's performance, but not worry about Cameron Diaz or really DiCaprio in that movie either. I, I could really take or leave either of them. Whenever Lewis is on screen, the dude is just electric. In fact, I was telling you earlier, I've been online about this all the time. I just read this book, Lincoln and the Bardot. I'm not going to go into it right now because I've been boring everyone to death with my praise for it. But I was reading this book about Lincoln. And Day Lewis's performance of Lincoln was so good that I actually cannot picture the real Abraham Lincoln in my head when I read this book. Oh, wow. I am picturing Daniel Day Lewis and his performance because he is his performance is so good and humanizing. And when you first hear his voice and you're like, oh, geez, that's I didn't expect his voice to sound like that. And it gives this air of authenticity because you go, oh, we've been thinking about it all wrong. He actually would have sounded like this other thing. Um, he really does a good job in that movie of like replacing the actual man in my mind. Oh, that's amazing. Which surprises me. And he was, he was who I was hoping would play Dr. Strange before I'd even thought about Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, but that'd be hard. He is a very method actor. Right. And so if he was walking around the set casting spells, I think <laughs> as, as a caterer, I would get sick of that real quick. Yeah. He'd probably be casting them with his left foot, right? Yeah. Well oh done. God, well done. There. Um, let's end this episode with two great buddy Hackett jokes. Okay. Go for it. So I've been watching a lot of classic tonight show. I loved on the tonight show when people came on, when they didn't have anything to promote, it was like, they were just stopping by mm -hmm. To say hello, and they, you know, had something fun. And I love Buddy Hackett, and Buddy Hackett had an amazing uh, set of jokes. So he's like, he's like, I'm, I'm doing this event, and it's about, uh, it's about agriculture. And so I have these jokes, and the jokes got to have a farmer in them. And so he's setting this up to Johnny, and he keeps coming back. He's like, so don't forget, every joke's got to have a farmer in it, right? A farmer and an animal. So I'm getting animals, and I'm getting farmers in the jokes. <laughs> So he tells two jo two jokes, uh, th well, three jokes. I'm going to tell you the second two jokes. Second joke. He goes, there's this uh, woman, and she decides she wants to know what farm life is all about. She's grown up in the city her whole life. So she drives out of the city, and she goes to a farm. She goes up there. The farmer says, hey, welcome to the farm. What can I tell you? And she goes, why doesn't that cow over there have horns? Farmer says, that's a really great question. So there's a bunch of reasons why cows don't have horns. One of the reasons is uh, we milk them and they can get a little agitated. And so we grind the horns off so that if they buck, they won't you know, hurt us. And it's all right. It doesn't hurt the cows at all. It just makes it easier for us to milk them. And they like being milked ultimately. So it's a good thing. Uh, another thing is sometimes cows out in the pasture, they get violent with each other. They got to share the pasture with other cows. And so what we'll do is we'll clip off the antlers. Again, it doesn't hurt the cow at all, but we clip off the, uh, the horns to make sure that they don't hurt each other while they're out there. And then also baby cows, sometimes you don't want them to have. So you put a little bit of acid right where the horns would form and it ends up scarring that tissue there. Again, it's, it's not painful to the cow, but then they don't end up growing horns. But that cow over there, the reason that cow doesn't have horns is because it's a horse. But I'm bumped. Quackity schmackity right? do. And there's something about a joke that takes so long to yeah. tell with just a simple punchline like that <laughs> that I can't get enough of. And it's a very vaudeville 
type mm-hmm. of humor. Mm-hmm. Uh, joke number three. And again, these jokes are about a farmer and they got to have an animal in there somewhere because he's going to go and talk at this event for farmers who have animals. <laughs> Johnny, don't forget. So uh, this this guy is it's the first time he's ever gone hunting and he's going to go duck hunting. So he gets himself a dog and probably a gun and he gets himself the proper clothing and he goes out and he's in the water and he's waiting in the water. And he's waiting in the water. He sends the dog out. The dog rushes into the reeds. A bunch of ducks fly up in the air and a guy gets the gun and bang. He gets a shot off. He clips a duck. And so he's watching the duck. He's watching the duck. It gets pretty far away. He can barely see it anymore, but he sees it finally goes down. It's wounded enough that it finally goes down. So he and the dog start walking. It's about an hour walk to get where this uh, this duck was. They finally get there, and the duck is just on the other side of a fence in a farmer's backyard. So the guy hops over the fence and he goes to pick up the duck but before he can get to the duck a big farmer now remember these jokes have got to have a farmer (laughs) and an animal in them (laughs) big farmer got the bib overalls comes up and he goes what do you think you're doing and he says i shot this duck i'm here to get it. it's my duck and he goes no you don't know about property do you this is my property so it fell here so it's my duck guy says no i'm the one i'm the hunter i was out there and i shot him and now it's here it's in a farmer's backyard because remember the jokes about a farmer and it's got to have an animal in it and he says it's my duck i'll it's my duck it's mine i'm the one who shot it i did all the work farmer says there's a way we settle these things out in the country you know he goes what i'm gonna do is you and i are going to settle this in a country style which means that We'll go back and forth, kicking each other in the groin as hard as we can, and the last man standing will get to keep the duck. It's how we've solved things for hundreds of years in the farming community. <laughs> Guy says, geez, well, I mean, if that's going to be how I get my duck fine, farmer goes, okay, I'm going to go first because it's my property. So the farmer takes a step back and whoomp, right into this guy's groin. Oh! Oh, 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 God. oh, 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 my turn. Farmer says, ah, you can have the duck. <laughs> That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help us continue to produce new episodes each week, visit JJMeetsWorld.com, where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some swag at the merch shop, or follow our link to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all the sites the cool kids are using these days. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by visiting moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, check out linebenders.com where you can find direct contact info for JJ or booking information. Oh! Oh, God. oh, I think I can taste them. Ah.